welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast. Our podcast features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to quality early learning and care, with a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. I'm Maura Corbett and I work with Early Childhood Ireland. In this series of the podcast, we're looking at the area of well-being. As we know, Ashther's theme of well-being is all about children being happy and healthy. So in this series, we're looking at all aspects of children being happy and healthy. And in this particular episode, we're going to take a look at children's emotional health and well-being and how trauma can impact on this. So my guest for this episode is Sharon Byrne, who has recently written a great publication called Trauma in Young Children. Sharon is the Early Years Development Coordinator with Bernardo's. She has over 25 years experience working in early childhood education and care, and she currently coordinates a range of supports for the sector. She's particularly interested in infant and early childhood mental health and trauma informed practice. She's an experienced trainer and a facilitator of parenting programs. So Sharon, it's a pleasure to be chatting with you and you're really welcome on the podcast. Oh, thanks, Myra. So Sharon, I, I dipped in and out of the, the publication um, and, uh, you, you know, having done um, my, uh, my master's dissertation was on the whole area of, um, it was called What's Love Got to Do With It? And it was on the, you know, the whole area of, supporting emotional development and um, attachment and um, you know how important that um, the whole area of children's emotional development is um, as a foundation before we you know attend to anything else you know making sure that children are safe that their emotions are, are contained so can you take us through a bit of you know it, it, what trauma is what your research has shown trauma is and um and how trauma can affect children yeah sure thanks Mara. i'm absolutely delighted to be here actually because I, I love listening to your podcast and i've enjoyed uh listening to all the different episodes um, oh that's great that's, so. that's good to hear that's good to hear thanks a million sharon no bother so in terms of um trauma i suppose um it comes from the Greek word for wound. And often when we think about childhood trauma, we think about those kind of bad things that might have happened to children. So we might think about things like abuse or neglect, or we might think about children growing up maybe in very chaotic households. And of course, those things are really traumatic, but that's not really what we mean by trauma. Trauma is, as we said, it's it's the word for wound. So when we think about what those traumatic kind of events or situations that children may be living, the, the wound that they sustain as a result. And there's um, a really great guy called um, Dr. Gabor Mate. You've probably come across him at some stage. And he talks about trauma and he says, I, I just love this quote. He says, trauma is not the bad things that happen to us. Um, it's the bad things that happen inside of us as a result. So it's just to be thinking about that because we probably all know maybe children and adults in our lives, maybe personally and professionally, that have had those bad things happen to them, um, but not necessarily have been traumatized and have had those kind of long-term impacts when we hear about trauma. So it's just kind of important to just kind of say that I think from the beginning. So in terms yeah, and, that, and that checklist that's in that's in the publication, I you know, I found that that it was that kind of cumulative, cumulative yeah. effect that, yeah. you know, a, a lot of us would have experienced maybe you know one or two of those traumatic events mm -hmm. that's in that's in that checklist in the book but it's that when you have those events layered one on top of the other maybe ah. and the adults in your life are maybe coping with the same traumas and aren't able to attend to, yeah. to you because they're dealing with their own that's yeah. probably part of it is it yeah, so when you're talking about the checklist, I'm I'm thinking you might be, we've talked a lot in the book at the beginning about the ACES study. So the ACES study is a really um, important kind of seminal piece of research. And that took place in the 90s in America. And what that did was it was a massive study. There was like over 17,000 participants. And they looked at, you know, they, they looked at childhood trauma. They looked at what we call adverse childhood experiences. So some people might have heard of that or they might have heard of ACES for short. 
And they, they came up with a list of uh, 10 different kind of categories of adverse childhood experiences. So they looked at things like maybe um, traumatic events that might happen in a child's home. So things like abuse and neglect. Um, but they also looked at what they called household dysfunction. So they looked at things like parental separation, um, parental addiction, parental mental health problems. So things like that. Um, and they were able to relate that. They also linked in with... Um, uh, in the, the, all the study participants kind of shared information around their own health um, and their well-being. And for the first time, they were really able to see that trauma has serious lasting or can have, should I say, serious lasting uh, detrimental impacts on people's health, their well-being, their life opportunities. Um, so and that was really looking at adverse childhood experiences within those 10 categories. But I'm always cautious to say to people like, adversity is more than just sometimes when we hear aces we kind of get stuck thinking of the aces study and thinking of these kind of checklists as you say that list of aces but it can be so much more than that so there's another framework called the building community resilience framework and that looks at yet yeah, those things that maybe can be very traumatic as we're growing up within our own homes but also things in our community that can be very traumatic so things like experiencing discrimination poverty, homelessness, things like, you know, obviously we're currently hearing a lot about the experiences maybe of children and families that are coming from Ukraine, so those kind of experiences. So the really, unfortunately, there's no end, you know, when we're thinking about what possibly could cause trauma. And you mentioned there, Mara, about the importance of those kind of the caregivers of those children, which is really key when we understand well, why might one thing be traumatic and the exact same thing not be traumatic for somebody else for one child and not for another and um, so I suppose I always find the easiest way to get my head around it is to think about it in terms of stress so um, what the experts would say is there's three different types of stress there's positive stress tolerable stress and what we call toxic stress and toxic stress is the one that we really worry about when we're thinking about trauma. So your positive stress is like, if you think of a child, maybe their first day in preschool or the first week in preschool, of course, for loads of children, that's going to be quite stressful, you know, and maybe their heart might be a little faster. They might have some of those stress hormones, you know, the courts on adrenaline run through their body. But we call it positive stress because it kind of motivates them. It may be, they might be on a little bit high alert. They might be looking around trying to suss out, you know, it's a new environment. Who should I play with? What should I do? Who's this adult here? Is she a nice adult or are they not a, you know, will I go over it and talk to them or what might I do? And then hopefully you would imagine after those first couple of weeks that those stress levels come down. So we call it positive. And then we look at things that are taught what we call tolerable stress. And they're those bad things that can happen in children's lives, um, such as maybe, for example, a parent dying. And of course, that's going to be a very stressful event in any child's life. But we call it tolerable stress. So we, so we know that there's serious stress responses from things like that. So like you might see a child that was really outgoing and now there may be quite tearful, quite withdrawn, maybe very clingy. You might have a child having nightmares, maybe they were toilet trained and they're having toilet accidents. So we're talking about serious stress there. But if a child has um, those caring adults in their lives that are able to buffer that serious stress. So if you think maybe the child's other parent is able to support them, maybe there's other family or friends that are able to rally around and really help to kind of buffer all of that stress. Maybe in the early year service, you know, the, the child has a key person that's able to help them. They might even get professional help with the result that maybe over a period of time. And of course, it's always going to be really sad that that happened in that child's life and we're not going to be taking that away. But it's um, it's you're hoping over a period of maybe months that the child might start to come back to themselves and recover and become more resilient, you know. So that's kind of what we're always trying to aim for when we see those serious events. But unfortunately, what can happen for some children is that they suffer from what's called toxic stress. So that's when we talk about the difference of um, something being traumatic and maybe not having those long-term impacts. So with traumatic stress, it's again, it's serious stress responses like it is with the tolerable one. So, um, but with the difference being that that child maybe didn't have access to enough 
um, of that buffering, of enough of that caregiving from a caring, attentive adult that they were able to buffer that stress. And that might be because it's not about blame. That might be because maybe their primary caregivers are in very stressful situations themselves. Or maybe, as you mentioned earlier, it could be just the kind of doses of stress is so high. So the child is maybe having to cope with such an amount of stress. So an example might be a child growing up in a home where there's domestic violence. And in that situation, maybe one parent is very scared all the time and the other parent is scary. And when that happens, there's not going to be that available, consistent caring adult to be able to buffer that ongoing stress for that child. And what happens then is it turns into what we call toxic stress. So it really changes, has a really kind of long term change in terms of how the body works and how the brain works. Um, and that's when we kind of we get into the situation where we see those negative impacts of trauma. Really, I mean, relationships are a completely fundamental part of supporting children with, yeah. with, with trauma and um, and the role of early years, you know, particularly in, in maybe some of those examples that that, that you mm -hmm. gave of the death of a parent or even a close grandparent or yeah. sibling even sometimes um or if there's uh if there's if it's there's an abusive situation in, in the home the role that early years educators have in supporting those relationships and helping the children to develop the resilience to be able to yeah. manage it's key isn't it it's absolutely key. Like they would say, when we look at a trauma-informed approach, relationships is number one in terms of supporting children to recover and become resilient. Um, so in an early years, so obviously you would want the child's primary caregivers to be able to offer those buffering relationships. And we don't know sometimes what's going on in terms of children's home lives and in terms of those parents and those family members and what might be going on for them. And we sometimes see things like what we call intergenerational trauma where children's parents themselves have been traumatized and that can impact on how they're able to kind of buffer stress for their child you know so it's kind of then it really comes into play the important key role that relationships have for for young children so and it, like if you think of a newborn baby being stressed so maybe a newborn like a young baby who's um maybe hungry and they're getting stressed because they're hungry and they cry and the first thing that you would hope a caregiver might do is first of all recognize that pick the child up, offer comfort, maybe tell, oh, you poor baby, come on, I know you're hungry, come on, and rock the baby and, you know, talk in a soothing voice. And we will call that co-regulation. So that's kind of what another word for that. Um, and some children have loads of experience of being co-regulated co when they were infants and toddlers and preschoolers and other children maybe haven't had those experiences or just haven't had enough of those experiences so when they come into an earlier service they're still at the stage where they need that co-regulation and that's where the the relationship comes in that the best way to mitigate the stress that comes from trauma and that kind of um, those stress responses that children can be experiencing is through providing that consistent care and relationship. So when we think about, you mentioned attachment there, I think it's part of your research, Mara, I was delighted to hear that. So attachment, really secure attachment, should I say, is the best protection against trauma. But when we're thinking about young children, when we're thinking about babies, toddlers and preschoolers, unfortunately, um, trauma often, uh, if it isn't young children's lives, it can be coming through that relationship because obviously young children are so dependent on the, those relationships. And because of that, we really need to address and support children to recover from trauma through relationships. So it makes perfect sense. So when we're thinking about um, attachment in the earlier services, an opportunity there for the, the child's early as educator to be their secondary attachment figure, to really like, so a key person approach is, you know, obviously something that we're all advocating for. Um, in particular, when we're talking about infants, toddlers and preschoolers, and it's definitely when we're talking about part-time and full-time care but obviously if we can all the time it would be great mm. um, oh it's so important 
Uh, it's 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 really key, like obviously for all children, but in particular when we're thinking about children that have experienced trauma, mm. because they one we need to get to know them really really well, and um, and when we think repetition is key. So if children haven't had enough of those positive um, experiences to help buffer that trauma, we need to give them so much more of that than maybe other children in our service mm. might. You know, so it's that kind of repetition. So to, to be able to that, you really need to have a very strong relationship with that child because you're trying to build a new experience. You want to and, build and a- and with the families, with the parent, you know, one yeah. of my favorite quotes that has kind of stayed in my head all these years is Peter Elfer um talking about the key person approach and the point of view, as one parent said, you only have to get to know one of them not all of them yes. and that you know for a parent coming in particularly a parent who's maybe experiencing trauma themselves and looking yeah. to you to support them and their child and yeah. you know we'll come to who cares for the carers in a minute because that's that's vital you know if you have to explain your backstory to a different educator every time you drop your child you're going to stop yeah. and that's going to impact on the child I think and to even know that backstory, that's going to be a huge amount of trust that that parent must have in that key person. So that relationship, again, is really key. Now, we don't always need to know what maybe traumatic experience mm. we've had to support them, but it can be really, really helpful. And yeah. it can be really and parents need that trust in you before yeah. they can share something as intimate as, as, as that very often, you know, sometimes we know if it's, you know, if, if it's, if, if it's death or homelessness or something like that, you know, we, we know as educators, but if it's a domestic violence situation, that's so hard to talk about. Yeah. You're, you, yeah. you're not going to be talking about that willy nilly you really need to trust somebody so you know it's, it's supporting the parents to build up that trust to be able to to share something as 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 Definitely. deep as that with you isn't it and when we talk about again about kind of that trauma informed approach or building trauma awareness and um, one of the kind of key principles of a trauma informed approach is trying to establish safety and of course how we do that establish safety for young children is through the relationship because if a child doesn't have like um that key person in their life that they can go to for support for comfort when they're distressed that's going to be kind of also their secure base to support them to go and make friends and to learn if they don't have that attachment figure then they're going to feel really really unsafe in their service and in that service and also within themselves you know so again in terms of establishing safety for children and for families we need to have that trusting consistent caring relationship and, and we and- know and that feeling of uh, you know for a child of not feeling secure not feeling safe Mm -hmm. can lead to them behaving in ways that um you know we need to be so careful that we're not uh pushing them away and pushing them further that you know through our interactions and relationships we really do help them to build up that security in spite of however they might be manifesting their insecurity And when you mentioned there about kind of manifesting their insecurity and behaviours, and that's often um, how we kind of maybe come to start thinking about trauma and what does trauma mean and building trauma awareness, because we maybe are seeing behaviours in children and not really knowing how to meet their needs and how to support them. And when a child has experienced trauma and have that has experienced that toxic stress that I mentioned earlier, that's how we're probably going to like see that manifest in our service. So you'll see um, a lot of people probably heard of those kind of stress responses or survival responses. We call them maybe a fight, flight and freeze responses. And there are other ones, but I, I'll just stick with those ones today. And um, But we know that when like adults and children, when we um, feel under threat, what happens is our fight, flight and freeze response kind of kicks in. And with a child um, that's experienced trauma, what could happen is because maybe if they've talked to stress, as we said, they haven't had the experience of having that stress buffered with the result that they can have what we call an overactive stress response. So they might be in your earlier service. You might have a gorgeous service with lovely environment, key person approach, brilliant routines in place, all of these things. And in that situation, it can be very hard to understand what might be going on for a child. Why are they behaving this way? We have all of these kind of 
great strategies in place, you know, that work most of the time. And they're the times when you kind of go, God, this child's behavior is really concerning. And, and I don't really understand. I can't see any triggers. It's happening a lot. It's not a once off that they were maybe having a bad day. It happens maybe every day, several times a day that we start to get curious and we wonder, is this what I'm seeing? Could this be a stress response? Could this child have an overactive stress response? So when I mentioned the kind of fight, flight and or freeze behaviors. So what we're thinking there, like in, in the case of a child, maybe. So if you're seeing a lot of the fight behaviors, you know, a child that's maybe hurting themselves or hurting other children a lot, um, maybe very, very angry child, maybe throwing ties, breaking ties, those kind of things where you can't actually, because obviously there can be loads of reasons why that can happen. It could be developmental stage, it could be anything. But it's those times when you really kind of go, I really, you're at a loss. It's, you know, maybe to think about could it possibly be that? Or with flight, you might see a child that has very um, high activity levels. Um, maybe as soon as the door is open, they're gone. You know, they're climbing on, you know, they're under the tables, they're over the tables. They kind of have to be in the line first. You know, those kind of things. You might start thinking about that as well. And then the other one is the freeze behaviors. And they're the ones I find when I'm going into services they're the ones maybe that go under the radar more often because the fight and flight, if you're seeing that a lot in your service, like it's going to be really, really, um, I suppose, disruptive um, and very stressful for the child themselves and for the other children and the adults. It's, it's certainly not hidden. No, it's not hidden. <laughs> Um, where the other one can be. So with the freeze behaviours, it's where maybe a child that's coming across very, you know, I'm not talking about just quiet, you know, as in having a quiet temperament, but a child that maybe into the, to the extreme that you're, you're quite concerned about, a very withdrawn, maybe looking like they're daydreaming all the time. You know, a child where you might be calling their name, they're not really, they're not hearing you, you're having to go over maybe and touch them like gently on the arm to get their attention. So there are those some examples of what you might see in the in the, the freeze behaviors. And with that in mind, we would call that um, a child whose behavior is dysregulated. So if a child is having a stress response, um, what we're seeing is dysregulated behavior. So that's kind of the word that we would use. And I, I, I know I mentioned regulation earlier in terms of co-regulation. So you can see how it would make sense if a child is having dysregulated behavior, if they're overwhelmed, if they're like, you know, not able to manage the intensity of their emotions or the duration their emotions are going on for, they're going to be overwhelmed. And then we see that dysregulation. So they're going to need back to that relationship. They're going to need that available caring adult to be able to do that co-regulation piece with them, to be able to support them to come back to a place where they're calm and they're alert again. Um, and it's not it's not easy, but um, it's it's kind of what we need. I, mean, I like to think of it. I you might have heard also Dan Siegel, mm. and he, he writes and talks a lot about um kind of the development of the mind and all of that. And he uses this great kind of imagery of um a window of tolerance, and he says that everybody has a window of tolerance. So if you kind of imagine the window there, um, and when we're in our window of tolerance, like we're able as adults to kind of make plans and think logically and be creative and children when they're in their window towns they're able to play they're able to develop they're able to kind of make their friends too but when some children who've experienced trauma their window of tolerance can get really really small and that means that something tiny maybe like they heard a raised voice in the room or maybe a stranger came in, or maybe something like a smell might be enough to trigger a previous um, kind of traumatic experience. And that's enough to push them out of the window of tolerance um, with the result that they go into those fight, flight and freeze behaviors. So as um, early as educators, what we're really trying to do when we talk about kind of that co-regulation piece, um, we're trying to support children to stay in that window of tolerance. And over time with repetition, repetition and positive experiences, we want to make that window bigger and support them so they can tolerate more stresses, you know, without going into those stress responses. Um, and then, of course, when they do feel that they're pushed out the window and they're in those survival responses, we want to support them in terms of that co-regulation to bring them back 
into their window. So I just think it's a really effective way to think about it, um, that window of tolerance. And, and, and that helps them move into the area of self-regulation then, doesn't it? That once, yeah. you know, once they've that security and kind of comfort blanket, if you like, of co-regulation, they get to a stage where they're able to um, manage the stressors themselves, at least some of the time. Exactly. And I think sometimes as educators, we have expectations on what children at different ages should be able to do in terms of self-regulation. And we know like all going well, children are able to start doing that self-regulation when they're about three and a half or four. But that's of all going well. If a child hasn't had enough experiences of being co-regulated, they're not going to magically be able to self-regulate it doesn't happen that way they have to have had enough experiences so you might be working with a child in an after school service for example that is still struggling with that self-regulation and we need to remember okay this child needs our support and I need to help co-regulate them so if it's like I know you didn't want to come in you wanted to stay outside I know when it's time to come in from outdoors I know that's that must be really hard whatever it is that you're doing to try and support them to to co-regulate so that then hopefully as the window of tolerance gets bigger they're able to go to a place where they can self-regulate and often and um, when I am in services sometimes we look at children it came up today actually with a group that I was with in earlier service and um, we had the whole discussion around self-regulations versus compliance. And sometimes we see children that can be really, you know, kind of follow instructions and do, you know, what's asked of them, for example. But that's not the same thing as self-regulation. You know, so self-regulation is in the word. Are they able to self-regulate? Because if we're kind of telling them what to do in situations, you know, oh, you have to share, you have to give her whatever it is, that's not what we mean by self-regulation that's just a child being compliant and many children are compliant but then that can also be a trauma response to if some children really to survive they've had to learn how to be you know to do what they're told and to do it very quickly so yeah there's so so much there and you know we talk a lot about you know even in, in the past 20 minutes or whatever we've been talking about the adult should and the educator should and you know I, I, I mentioned a little while ago that we talked for a few minutes before we wrap up about how important it is for educators to be have their own emotions around this kind of contained and, and supported um, have you some um, words of wisdom oh. on uh, caring for the carers as the, the, the chapter in your book says um I, I also yeah definitely Mara I also there's another phrase the cost of caring now I, I didn't put that in the book I don't think but um there is a cost in terms of caring for children particularly children that have experienced trauma and that you're you're trying to to um that you're seeing all that dysregulated behavior because we all know working in early years is a, it's a stressful job at the best of times, you know, and um, we know that, um, like we heard a lot, particularly which is, is good when we're, we're more mindful of staff well being because we can get burnout. But when we think about caring for children that have experienced trauma, not only are we also conscious of the burnout factor, but we're conscious of something called secondary trauma. Um, so that's us as early as educators, you know, being particularly vulnerable, I suppose, to um, hearing about children's traumatic experiences or even trying to um, when we're doing that co-regulation piece we often rely a lot on our empathy and when we rely on empathy what's happening is we're getting a little taster of that child's distress and that can really wear us down over a period of time you know so it's so so important if we are dysregulated ourselves if we've started to move into our fight flight and freeze then there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to regulate a dysregulated child it just just is impossible you know so we have to prioritize our own well-being when we're working with young children and um, we have to start thinking about you know 
are like I know we talked a lot about we talk a lot about reflective practice in early years um, and thinking about maybe how we can do things differently but we don't talk as much about self-awareness um, and going that bit deeper than just the self-reflection to be thinking about well what kind of things do I find triggering are there particular emotions that when they come up for children that I find stressful why might that be can I take a moment you know in those situations to have a pause and to kind of go okay I'm feeling really stressed now but what do I need to do in this situation to meet this child's needs so having that kind of that kind of put, putting that priority I suppose on ourselves because we're not going to you know the, you hear that old saying um you can't drink from an empty cup you know so making sure that we keep our own emotional cup filled and how we do that a lot is like a kind of couple of ways so one of the ways is self-care so being again mindful of what we find stressful um, and then access and supports around that but also trying to what kind of things do we do like to resource ourselves so things like you know looking after our physical needs are we going to the doctor when we need to are we getting enough sleep be all of those things thinking about our emotional self-care thinking about what what we find fun to do what we find playful and building it into our everyday lives rather than kind of you know, every so often getting a massage or something, which I was a very nice thing to do, but we want to build things in on a daily basis. But I'm always cautious when we think about, we talk about self-care a lot, there shouldn't, that responsibility shouldn't be on that individual early as educator. You know, it should be on whatever, the whole setting or if you're working in an organization, it's that responsibility there, that collective care. Um, to be thinking about the well-being of teams um, in early year services. And how we do that is like really trying to build. So those relationships that we talked about are so important for children. They're really important for us too. So actually focusing on that team building piece on that relationship, maybe in terms of um, even that supervisory relationship and the adult in the service have an access to support and supervision from their line manager where they can go, let them know they feel stressed, they need help with something, maybe to talk about a particular case with a child, for example. And thinking about even accessing, you know, those professional supports, whether that's mentoring supports with yourselves or with Bernardo's, having access to training, uh, different resources and things. So it's really around, okay, first of all, we have to be in a place where we're not stressed, we're not dysregulated, so we can support children. And how we do that is through our self-care and through the care of the organisation that we work with. And I suppose even colleagues, when, you know, if, if you observe a colleague in a room seeming to find a particular situation um, challenging, that you kind of step in and you know, if yeah. at all possible, give them the opportunity to take five and, um, yeah. you know, kind of ha have, a, have a breather because, you know, these events can be triggering for ourselves as well sometimes. And I mean, we are working with children when we hear about children that like have been maybe in traumatic events, it can really stir something up in ourselves. You know, Ron said, Out outrage, how can this have happened to this child, you know? It, and that again adds to that stress. Um, and then we might have our own unresolved trauma mm. um, and that can come up for us when we're caring for children. It can bring up maybe consciously or maybe subconsciously, you know, things from our own past that we might never have had the opportunity to kind of work through. Um, we maybe are, really stuck in terms of resources and we don't have non-contact time and we're maybe short staffed or we might have you know somebody's leaving and somebody new is starting so all of those things are going to contribute to um you know causing us to feel overwhelmed so Sharon it's you know and then for owners and and managers to be conscious of that and uh, you know and that you can support everybody but that you need to find, a, you know, a mechanism, somebody that you can kind of debrief with yeah. as well. Like if um, we're talking about supporting children, the first thing we always do is, is talk about how we should support their parents. to support, mm. parents. And it's the same like logic, if you like, to be able to support the children, we need to support their caregivers. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, Sharon, I mean, we could we could do a series on on the whole, you know, and I'm very conscious we just dipped in and out. It's um, it's a lovely book. So much to, you know, you you discuss about engaging with with families, and you can't take any of these things in isolation. You have to work mm-hmm. with with children, with your colleagues, with with families, and understand the concepts yourself. So I'd encourage everybody to um have a have a look at the uh, at the book and thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to us today oh, we, you, we really you. appreciate it and um you know it's 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 such a thought-provoking area but so important and it's great that we have um you know year on year we're developing an increased awareness of the importance of being being aware of of trauma and the impact that um events have on on children and ourselves so Sharon Thank you so much for for taking the time. And uh, thank you for listening to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast. Uh, If you enjoyed the podcast, please tell your friends and colleagues and uh, please tune in next time. Talk to you soon. Mm